first audition, professional audition you did was for Theater Under the Stars? Um, no, I guess the first, yes, professional audition, I suppose, was for Theater Under the Stars. Uh, but uh, that came after I had um, auditioned for a contest called Singing Stars of Tomorrow, which was held in Toronto. And um, that contest had, had uh, sent me back east to, um, uh, to perform for the first time with orchestra in my life. And, uh, uh, but uh, when, when, you, when you want to define it as a first professional audition, I guess Theatre Under the Stars was the first professional audition. Well, since we're talking about it, why don't we just talk briefly about that experience of going to Toronto and, I mean, that must have been quite an exciting time for you. It was, it was exciting, but, but it's, it was kind of scary too because there were so many firsts involved. Um, I think it was the first time that I'd ever been on a long train journey and couldn't fly, went for five days on the train. And so th that was a, a great adventure. And uh, as I said before, the first time singing with orchestra and uh, the first time singing on radio. So it was, um, it was, uh, uh, a big adventure in my life. I, I didn't win the contest, but uh, it, it gave me a lot of publicity. And um, it was actually Beverly Fife, who was the, the um, chorus master for Theatre and the Stars for many, many, many years, who um, saw me uh, and heard me singing in a Kiwanis festival in the Vancouver Hotel. And uh, he, he came to me later and he said, have you ever thought of auditioning for Theater and the Stars? And I said, well, no, I, I hadn't. I had no idea how one got into Theater and the Stars. So he told me and I subsequently had an audition and uh, got a part uh, in uh, that season, the season of 46, in a production of Robin Hood. Now, not very many people know the operetta Robin Hood, and I think the only well-known piece of music from it is Oh, Promise Me, which you used to hear, hear sung at weddings all the time. <laughs> do you, uh, I mean, it's a long time ago, obviously, in 46, but um, do you, you know, what were your first, actually, I still wanted to talk a little bit about the radio, and, and um, do you remember the, the uh, facility that you worked out of when you arrived in Toronto? Could you describe a little bit about that? I mean, <laughs> Well, uh, it, uh, I don't think it was in the, a radio studio. It was just a big hall with, with, with an audience. That was it. That was it. Who was the producer? I don't remember who was the producer of it. It was a man by the name of Rex Battle who, who conducted the orchestra. Coming back to, uh, to Theater Under the Stars, was that uh, audition process when you first met Jimmy Johnson? Yes, it was. And... Uh, I think uh, Gordon Hilker was uh, at that audition because he was the, the artistic producer of Theatre and the Stars in those days. Was it a short audition? Do you remember anything about the actual process that you went through with them? No, and I don't even rem remember what I sang. All I know is that I got a, um, a sort of a second lead in it, which was was kind of a big thing for someone who'd had so little experience. The only thing I had done before that was um, acting and singing and acting in high school operettas. That was in Richmond High. Mm. Do you remember anyone in the company at that time that uh, played performed with you in the Robin Hood operetta? Um, I played opposite my partner, and that was Alan Dale, who, who was played by Desmond Arthur, and. Um, I think Richard Charles or Charlie Platt, he, he went by, by two names. Um, he changed his name at one point. I think he played Robin Hood, but um, it was conducted, I believe, by Stanley Bly, who was also um, a Sun music and drama critic at the time. But those are my memories of Robin Hood. <laughs> so 
presumably you had a good review from him. If he was. I don't. I. I don't think he <laughs> reviewed it. <laughs> so you must have worked several times with as Jimmy Johnson as directing you. Oh yes. And, yes. Uh, I remember talking on the phone about that quote about him being thought of as someone that was uh, sometimes more interesting to watch in this from this person's perspective. Uh, than the actors were. What, did, what are your memories of him as a director? Jimmy was a very sensitive director, very kind director, very quiet director. But I think above all, I have enjoyed Jimmy's rather quirky sense of humor. He was fun, he was fun to work with. Could you give me an example of his quirky sense of humor? No, I can't remember anything in particular, but I know it ran through, through uh, everything he did. Um, there are a lot of stories about Theatre of the Stars uh, that uh, have been, you know, sort of kind of almost historical descriptions of it. But, you know, because it had so many challenges, and it was an outside theater, um, you were always were at the mercy of of the weather. Mm -hmm. and, um, can you talk a little bit about what uh, what hap what some of the ideas that were were sort of introduced uh, to try to you know uh, keep the audience dry and uh well um, if rain threatened they were each member of the audience was given uh, a piece of, of butcher's paper a sort of rectangle of, of butcher's paper and um, the idea was that if it started to rain they could seek shelter under the trees and uh, put that paper on their chairs to, to keep the canvas dry so when the shower passed they could come back. Um, sometimes they didn't want to leave and I can remember that some of them would, would fold up this paper and make um, a sort of paper hats, you know, the soldiers hats and um, three-cornered and so from the stage, when you looked out to the audience, it sometimes looked like a, a sea of sailboats, you know, sort of slightly undulating as heads moved slightly. But that was, that was part of the fun of it. In fact, I guess there's a story, I don't know if you'd remember it, where the audience didn't want to leave, as you said, and uh, at the end of the performance, I guess the actors were so impressed of their staying power. Well, it wasn't just one performance, it happened many times. But I also remember another night when, um, uh, something went wrong with the lighting system and uh, we were just blacked out. And so they tried several different ways of, of lighting, but what they eventually did was they took down part of the fence around the, the, the audience enclosure and cars drove in and put their headlights onto the focus their headlights onto the stage and so we carried on with a kind of uh, variety performance each member who uh, of the cast who who felt they might do something entertaining for the audience went out and did it and um, sort of an impromptu concert and that held the audience's attention until they found the fault in the lighting system, and we're able to correct it, and we carried on with, with the show. That was that was quite an interesting evening. Yeah, I guess the only one that uh, of the performers that wasn't really sheltered was the director, the musical director, the conductor. The conductor. That's right. Uh, when it rained, well, actually, there, there was a canvas, uh, a, a metal sort of piping made out of what I'd call pipe material, uh, which made a framework over the orchestra. And if it started to rain or threatened to rain, they would roll out canvas over that metal frame so the orchestra was protected. And, of course, their instruments were protected too. But um, the conductor had to be out front where, where the performers could, could see him, so he wasn't the only one who, sh who was, who was, um, he was the only one who wasn't sheltered. But uh, the conductors usually came uh, equipped f for that kind of weather. And um, I never actually heard any complaints from them about it. I guess Harry Price was the, the, main, the main conductor for, 
Yes, I, I, I think he was. There, there were other conductors over the years. Uh, Basil Horsfall, I think, was initially, when Theatre on the Stars first started, the main conductor. And um, the first lead I took, first real lead, was uh, in Roberta, and that was conducted by Lucio Agostini, who was in, in town at that time. Uh, conductor from the East, uh, but uh, and, and Bev Fife occasionally conducted, but I think the, uh, the main conductor was, was Harry Price. If you were to describe Harry Price as someone who had never met him, um, uh, how would you, would that be a challenge? Was he no, he was very, um, very steady, very unruffled. And uh, when you looked, if you looked down at Harry from the stage, always gave you back a great big smile as if, you know, everything's just going fine, which made you in turn relax and enjoy what you were doing. There were, uh, you've told these stories before, but um, there were many other sort of challenges that you had to face there as a performer in terms of the the wildlife um, sort of coming a little bit closer than one would have <laughs> Well, I think, there, I think they were herons that used to nest in, in the trees that were on the, the eastern side of, of the enclosure, uh, because you would, you would hear that. They, they have a rah, rah, kind of a raucous um, noise that they make and you would hear that and and if you sort of if your attention was diverted and you look up into the trees you could see the branches bouncing up and down under something that was obviously very heavy as, as herons would would be and um, then we could hear seals barking in the distance and um, then oh peacocks peacocks would, would, would squeal. And um, then for when we did The King and I, the first performance of that, I think it was the opening night, uh, I, I was playing Mrs. Anna and I wore a very large hoop skirt. And just as, as I um, uh, got into the song, Hello Young Lovers, this very, very large black bird came onto the stage. I don't know if he was a, a large crow or perhaps a raven, but anyway, he seemed quite at home. And um, uh, all the time I, I, I was singing, he was just standing there looking at me, upstaging me, of course. And then at a certain part in the song, uh, I, I said, I sang, I know how it feels to have wings on your heels and to fly down the street in a trance. And I was choreographed to move forward in that. Well, my moving forward in this big hoop skirt frightened him, and so off he went. And so I could, I could finish the, the song without being upstage. But the next night, when the king was doing his one big number where he uh, center stage uh, the crow came or whatever it was came back again and stayed the whole time totally upstage and the next night did the same thing so we asked the parks board if they would mind catching this bird and putting him in captivity for, for the run of the show because we were being totally upstaged by him. And so they did that. The next year, we opened the season again with the king and I. And uh, we didn't have a visit from the crow, but a squirrel came. And he came up when I was singing to all the little Siamese children, um, getting to know you. Up he came, up over the framework on top of the orchestra and onto the stage. And he would stay there, and of course the children were fascinated with it, and so was the audience. And, and he would just occasionally move along, and finally, toward the end of the song, he'd go off. So again, we asked the Parks Board, would, could they do the same thing 
with the squirrel. But they came every night for, I'm sure, about 10 days of the run. And these handsome, big young men in beautiful spanking white uniforms with parks board, zoo written on the back, and they came armed with butterfly nets and traps and goodness knows what, and they, they never did catch him. So every night we were visited during that number. I think he probably had a, a, a nest up in the, the rafters somewhere, but they never did catch him. So it seems that the wildlife particularly like the king and I more than any of the other well, I have sometimes wondered if it was a rein reincarnation of the King of Siam. <laughs> he was getting even with the things he didn't like we were saying about him. <laughs> the, the, uh, the runs, the plays were not like today, months and months and months. They were quite often a week or whatever. And, and you uh, obviously were always in a, a motion from uh, rehearsing and and, and, and the, the fact that you actually had to uh, audition, or sorry, uh, rehearse um, at midnight for the next night, oh well that was the dress that was just the dress rehearsal for the next show well it um, it was the only way they could set the lighting for the show in the dark I mean they couldn't do it in the daytime obviously so a show would close on, on a Saturday night and um, the cast would be broken to go off and get some something to eat while the the set was struck, put away, and the new set for the next show was brought in and set up. And then uh, we would start with um, a costume parade. Everybody would come out in their different costumes. They'd be checked, be checked over. And then after that was all done, we'd start the dress rehearsal. And I can remember one that I think it was for Bittersweet um, that went on until about 8.30 in the morning. Was there any particular reason for that, or just just? Oh, I suppose they had problems. I don't remember what they were. Perhaps with with the sets, but but that was the time when all the bugs were were worked out. It was the only time they had, and then uh, the cast would have Sunday off, and we'd open on the Monday night. And it was one play per week, basically. Oh no, 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 no. Sometimes. Sometimes they'd run for for two weeks. I think that was usually the, around two weeks. And uh, the, the King and I, I think, the first time, ran for three weeks, at the end of the season. And then the shows usually ended before, the, just before the P and E opened. Reality struck, I guess, in terms of where the audience. Well, the audience. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in King and I, um, who played the king? Uh, a man by the name of Leonard Graves, and he had played the Kralla home in the touring company of the King and I with Yule Brynner for some years. And um, but he was a very very strong performer, and uh, and we hit it off very well. Uh, I can remember, I was uh, in the rehearsal hall before. The, the, he arrived in Vancouver. I was in the rehearsal hall one day, and um, I was just going through things by myself. It was an empty space, and the rest of the cast were rehearsing something else at the time. So um, I, I was just, as I say, by myself. And this man walked into the room and introduced himself. So I said, well, shall we? Shall we run through some things? And so we did, and, and it, was, it was just it was just marvelous. He was very, very strong, and he was wonderful in the "Shall We Dance" number, where where they they do a polka together, and um, he was marvelous to dance with. So that that was great fun every night. The only the only frightening thing about that was not getting too far to the front of the stage when we were we were circling round and round the stage so quickly. It was great fun. Mm. I think uh, we mentioned that you did work briefly with Robert Clothier, or you didn't? Uh, well, that was very, very, um, well, it was, it was, um, I don't, 
can we stop? Sure. Yeah. That can that can come up. Okay. I'll start that again. Continue. It was um, in Floridora, which I think was in about forty nine, and um, I was um, I hadn't graduated to leading roles at that point. I mean, the leading role, the female leading role. Uh, and I was um, in the Floridora Sextet, which, which was great fun. That tell me pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you? Um, and uh, I don't think, I don't think I had any scenes with, with Robert. I can remember him looking very, very dapper in his military uniform that he wore. And um, not, I didn't get to know him too well. He seemed a very serious young man to me at that time and um, seemed to, seemed to be sort of focused within his part and uh, seemed to be concentrating very much on, on what he was doing. So I really didn't get to know him then. It was subsequently that I, I worked with Robert and, and uh, find him so different to my image of him that, fo la that long ago. That first impression. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dorothy Davies is someone who uh, made a huge contribution to theater uh, on the West Coast and uh, was obviously involved in Theater of the Stars. Yes, I don't remember. I don't remember seeing Dorothy in anything. Whether she, uh, I'm not sure whether she acted in theater on the stars or not. But she certainly directed, and um, she directed uh, me in uh, Kiss Me Kate, which was uh, which was a, a, a learning experience because Dorothy was quite meticulous and. And um, when, when we were in the playing period, I remember she came almost every night and took notes and would come backstage after the show and, and give notes. She, she'd say, for instance, well, I, I don't think this section is working quite as well as it should. Um, try doing such and such or thinking of such and such or taking such and such an attitude in it. And um, so at, at, the end, at the end of the run, I felt that, uh, that I had grown very much in, in the part and, and, and that I'd learned a lot from her. So that was, that was a marvelous experience. The, the, the show is very enjoyable to do anyway. It's, a, it's based on, you, as you probably know, The Taming of the Shrew. And so I played Kate, who was quite a, quite a strong and willful character and doesn't want to be bossed around as Petruchio wants to boss her around. And who was your Petruchio? Ralph Magelson, who... Uh, did a lot of the male leading parts for us in Tuts during those years. He was based in um, <clears throat> in New York. Would you say, that, I guess you probably have since said it, but would you say that I guess her, Dorothy Davies' style as a director, how would you compare it with Jimmy Johnson's? And would, was it quite distinct, quite different? Uh. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I can't sort of, now you ask me that, think of, of how it differed. Now that would take, that would take a lot of analyzing. Okay. Okay. 1956, I believe, was the first time that you worked uh, with Robert Goulet. Okay. 1956. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Infinite's Rainbow. Um, at that time, did he have much of a reputation, or was he pretty much just a young singer that came from? The East? Well, in Canada, he did. Um, I don't suppose he was he was known in the states, but he'd done a fair amount of of radio, and uh, um, 
I think by that time, some television work. Was he um, a very confident individual? How would you describe him <clears throat> when you first met him? No, I don't think he. I don't think he had done all that much stage work, so I don't think he was uh, overly confident. He was. He was a little wooden in his acting at the time, but um, he was. He was splendid when he sang. He had this wonderful, very rich, masculine baritone voice, and it was. It just poured out of him. It was just marvelous. Do there are there any is there any stories that um, or memories that stand out in the performance working with him that uh, any more than any others? Um, well, I remember one quite amusing one, which uh, we had um, uh, an embrace and a kiss uh, after one of the songs. And um, one night I'd gone on stage, <clears throat> I wasn't singing, and I don't think I had any lines in, in, in that scene. Um, I'd gone out with a rather large peppermint in my mouth. So during this kiss, I transferred the peppermint into his mouth <laughs> and left a very surprised-looking Bob Goulet on stage. <laughs> That's I have another peppermint story from Robert Clothier, so I can put those together. Oh, really? Peppermint. Oh, have you? Did he do a similar thing? Well, no, he, he um, you can stop tape for a second, but what happened was that he was doing a Julius Caesar, Queen's Rainbow, mm -hmm. that was, and one other, what other ones? I have, a, I have a, a, another story about Finian's Rainbow. Stories are good. I like stories. Um, I think this was the um, opening night. Um, there, were, there was, the, in the first scene of Finian's Rainbow, right center stage, is a tree. And this was a, a tree that they had to build. And at a certain point, I had to climb that tree and sit on a branch. And then, later on, I had to climb down and go into um, a song and dance routine. Well, coming down the tree, I caught my petticoat on, on something sharp in the tree. And as I came down, the petticoat ripped. And I didn't even know about it. And I went into the, this, this first song, and I was center stage, not knowing it, but there was this great big frill that had been stitched onto the petticoat that had come loose and was sort of hanging on the stage. And um, then at a certain point during the song, I had to circle around to other members of the cast who were sitting around the stage and sing to them and they would respond back to me. And um, one of the people who was sitting around the stage was Tommy Vickers, or Dean Regan, as you possibly know him. He too has changed his name several times. Anyway, uh, as I came to him, he very quickly, with great presence of mind, of mind, while my back was turned to the audience, grabbed the frill on the bottom of the skirt, ripped it and ripped it, and it was gone. So that when I came back and faced the audience, magically this, this dripping frill had been re re quickly removed. <laughs> but it could have been a hazard, you know, I might, I might have tripped over it. It reminds me of, uh, or makes me think about. Uh, was Excuse it? me, John. Yes, I worked with him on a, on a television special that we did. And when was that? Do you know? Oh, I don't remember the date for that. No. Was it before 1970, or was it in the 70s or 80s? I think it was probably late 60s. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you remember um, what that was? No, I don't remember much about it, except that um, I had to to do um, an entrance. It was filmed in the Queen Elizabeth Theater, and there was a big stairway, and I had to enter down this high stairway, and that was a bit scary because 
being on something high on the stage of the Queenie, there was this great abyss in front of me, the auditorium, and I had to sort of come running down the, the staircase wearing a merry widow gown, which was, um, you know, shaped with it and had a train at the back of it, and I had heels with shoes on, and that was a bit scary. That's what I remember about that principally. Had he uh, had his uh, acting become any less wooden? Uh, I don't think he had to act. I think it was just, just a matter of doing sing. musical numbers in, in that particular one. Oh, he did. I mean, he, he played in, in Camelot on, yeah. on Broadway, so he, he uh, was obviously a very quick learner. Yeah. Other than Tuts, you also uh, spent a few, had a few performances with the uh, Totem. Um, two. Two. With Totem Theatre. And that goes back again. The first one uh, was in Light Up Sky, and it was in Ambleside Park. That was in 1951. And um, uh, that was, um, th the conditions there were a little primitive, outdoor theater. Well, in fact, it was really just a, your, 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 your area where you changed were, were the um, baseball players also. Used, I think, it was not the, it was, possibly, possibly. It was, uh, yeah. In fact, there were times I think when baseball games went on while well, the performances went on. I don't remember that, but uh, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thor Arngren was the uh, one of the driving forces behind that. Yeah. yeah, Stuart Baker and Thor Arngren. What do you remember of Thor at those days? What kind of uh, entrepreneur kind of person was he? Really? I would say that what I remember most about him was his enthusiasm, enthusiasm for theater. And um, I remember him very much as, as he is today. He, he seems to have changed so little that um, he uh, always seems full of high, good, good spirits and still has his enthusiasm. I guess in those days he also did some performing, but not probably with you, I guess. He... Uh, no, he was um, more the production end of it. There's one story, I believe it's with uh, Light Up the Sky, with one of the actors who, who left uh, for a little longer than he was supposed to. And oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, in, in the story of Light Up the Sky, it's about um, a young writer and the opening of his first play. And uh, that the, the young writer was played by uh, an actor by the name of Stuart Baker. And uh, John Emerson played the role of a, an older, more experienced and successful playwright. And, um, and I played um, John's secretary, Miss Lowell. And I think we just had um, uh, a couple of entrances in the play. And um, I came in with him and exited with him each time. And there was a long gap of time in between the first scene we had and the second scene with Stuart Baker. And um, John was hungry. So he just thought, this is a thing one never <laughs> does in the theater, he went off to a, a nearby restaurant got himself a sandwich and John was an avid reader and so of course he he had something with him New Yorker magazine or a book and um, he ate his sandwich and he got interested in whatever literature he'd taken along with him meanwhile back at the stage um, I was waiting in the wings for our second entrance in which uh, John, as the older playwright, would come in and console the younger playwright because um, the play hadn't gone too well. There were things that, need to, in it, that needed to be rewritten. And this scene was the older playwright going in to console the younger playwright and tell him that, that this was a learning process he was going through and tell him that the kind of minor setbacks he had had when he was just starting to write plays. So I was waiting there, and time was passing, and the queue was getting nearer and nearer and nearer, and John wasn't in sight until 
the moment came and from behind someone shoved me on stage <laughs> subsequently happened i learned that it was it was dorothy davies who had directed the play and she just shoved me out so i had to i had to paraphrase what the playwright the older playwright would have would have said and 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 Stuart Baker looked absolutely astounded when just I walked out <laughs> but somehow we we got through it I, I knew I knew his lines well enough not to quote his lines verbatim but to to as I say just just paraphrase the the content of what he'd he'd say but the audience didn't seem to notice the difference <laughs> They usually don't. They just don't know what's going on behind the scenes. No, no. So much turmoil sometimes. The other production you did there, you went to um, 111 Dunsmuir. Um, I believe that's where the theater was, uh, where the old bus depot was. That's or right. Across from it, I guess. And um, do you remember that facility? I guess it was challenge. It was at a challenging um, stage to work. Or well, we. Uh, it, it wasn't the conventional stage with the proscenium arch and. It, um, the, it was, a, I think, a rectangular stage with audience on three sides. And uh, so, like all theater in the round, you have to play to different sides of, of the audience. And so it's, it's directed differently, it's blocked differently so that you're not always facing this, the same side. Uh, but, but that's how, in, how we behave in, in, in natural life, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're not just facing one direction. Uh, but you also, at the same time, have to be careful that you don't, you, don't, you, you have two more, when you're working an, on a rectangle with the audience on three sides, you have three edges not to fall off, and um, when you're not facing the audience, the audience is be that's behind you, you certainly have to keep the projection up in order that, that uh, all the audience will hear what you're saying. There were stories, maybe not during your run there, but of the audience members not being familiar with that whole sort of look, uh, actually participating in the play. There was a story of someone having a wanting to light a cigarette, and some of the audience came down and lit it, and um, there were other ones too. Did, mm -hmm. any, did any experiences like that happen to you when you were uh, performing at that? No, I, I, I don't, th I, I was in the, the man who came to dinner there, and I, I don't remember anything like that happened. But that, that does happen from time to time with, with any kind of audience. And you were directed by the infamous Ian Doby, who I guess didn't really have a lot of Good things to say about women at that from the sense of oh well in um in was a very high energy kind of person and uh he he didn't suffer fools gladly so you had to pay attention and try to get what he was saying the first time but um i i never experienced any any of that kind of rudeness with and I mean, he, he didn't, I don't remember him directing any at me, but, but you, you, you got used to it and just didn't pay too much attention to it. Was he, uh, was he a different type of director from what you had been used to with, let's say, Dorothy or Jimmy or? Yes, he was, um, he was sharper, I guess. Um, more, more direct, uh, yes, no, very much, no, no nonsense. Right. Who else was in the company at the, the mannequin dinner, do you remember? Uh, I think Bruno Gerussi, no, not, was he not? The man who came to dinner. Uh, Wally Marsh was in it. Doris Buckingham. 
there were a couple of boys who were very large who used to come down to a lot of the productions of theater on the stars were called the Levy twins. They were in that. Uh, Verly Cooter. I don't remember who else, but it was a large cast. And but you, you know, you're going back almost what? 50 years. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask me questions like that, I'd have a blank stare on my face. <laughs> if you'd fill up it, I would. You couldn't, <laughs> you, you haven't experienced yeah, 50 years. Yes, based mm -hmm. on my mm -hmm. memory to date. Um, another, uh, I guess, event or thing that took occurred, for instance, that happened back in that time, it doesn't happen anymore, were the Vancouver International Festivals, mm -hmm. which were wonderful, and it's unfortunate they're not around anymore, because I think that, you know. Yes. Um, in, I think they started in the, um, ooh, the late 50s. And uh, a lot of, of very interesting um, performances were, were brought into, performers and performances were brought into Vancouver from, from all over the world, some, some very exciting things. And um, I suppose that contributed, in a way, to the demise of Theatre Under the Stars, because it meant that the entertainment dollar was, was spread wider. And as I say, they did bring some very, very interesting and exciting things. Um, some things, some productions were produced right in Vancouver. And... Um, a lot of Vancouver performers were involved in them. Uh, I was involved in um, a production of The Magic Flute, which was directed by Harry Horner. And uh, uh, I think William McAlpine played the male lead in that. And uh, the, the costumes we wore had come from the Metropolitan Opera production of The Magic Flute. And so that was, that was very exciting. And uh, sometime later, I was in the production of The Most Happy Fellow with Robert Weedy. Um, I was singing in the pit with some other Vancouver singers in the Comédie Française production of the of Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, which was an interesting experience, sitting down there with, with a book with the English translation and the French de translation, so I could get it all. Um, then uh, I sang from the pit in a production of uh, West Side Story with the conductor Lawrence Foster later on. Uh, Threepenny Opera we did in the Playhouse for the festival. Um, so that was, although I was awfully sorry to see the demise of Theatre on the Stars, I think perhaps the festival and several seasons in a row where they'd had an awful lot of bad weather contributed to that. Did you, when you were at the Vancouver International Festival, did you perform primarily at the Playhouse? I mean, they did play in the earlier days in places um, which were described in many unflattering terms, like the Georgia Auditorium. Did you have to ever... No, I wasn't in that production. I, yeah, well, one production I think of was The World of the Wonderful Dark. Um, did you see that production? Yes, I did. Can you remember anything? Then? I thought it was fascinating. It was written by Lister Sinclair, and it was based on... West Coast Indians, Aborigines, and uh, I can. Re <laughs> one thing I remember about it was everybody being covered in Dallas dirt, and um, I, I can remember the story about one of the actresses in it who, who um, broke down at one point. She said, "Everything I've got, everything is covered with Dallas 
dirt. I can't get away from it. I've heard stories about every bathroom in British Columbia. All the towels <laughs> stayed with them. All the bathtubs with rings of Dallas dirt around them. That and the memorable death scenes by Barry Morris, who liked to use lots of, I guess, lots of blood and uh, enjoy. Yeah. That. Yes. Well, I, I I thought it was quite I thought it was quite fascinating. Um, it, it, no, the um, the magic flute was done in the Queen Elizabeth Theater, Threepenny Opera in the in the Playhouse. Um, Bourgeois Gentilhomme, I think, was done in the Queen Elizabeth. So maybe I was lucky and didn't have to. Play in the auditorium, the George Auditorium. <laughs> Although I have played there. You were also in the first season, I believe, of the Vancouver Playhouse. Yes, the second production, which was um, Sandy Wilson's *The Boyfriend*. Wackadoo, wackadoo, wackadoo. Um, I played Madame Dubonnet in that. That was fun. What was that first season like? Was there anything uh, that stands out? I mean exciting to be part of this new company. And, uh, oh yes, it always is. And uh, who was, uh, could you tell me a little bit about the artistic director? Michael Johnson was the artistic director. And where is he from? Where, where did he come from? And what, do you remember, what are your impressions or memories of him working with him? I, thi I think he was from the East, but I'm not absolutely sure about that. Um, well, my impressions of Michael, I, I, I didn't have very much to do with him, actually, but I do remember him coming into rehearsals and sitting and saying nothing. And I thought from the expression on his face that he didn't like what was going on at all. But subsequently, when I got to know him, I knew that that was just the way, just his normal expression. It wasn't, he wasn't disapproving really at all. But I subsequently got to know him better, liked him very much. And Malcolm Black directed you? Oh, yes. Lock Up Your Daughters. Uh, Lock Up Your Daughters. And, the, and uh, Walking Happy. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think Michael directed uh, the Threepenny Opera for the festival. What was Michael Malcolm Black like to work with for? He was interesting. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Also worked with Malcolm in uh, in Winnipeg in um, um, Rainbow Stage. The outdoor theater there. Uh, now that's an outdoor theater that is is covered. It has a huge, huge sort of oh, almost like an umbrella kind of dome over it. And um, he directed me in uh, Fiddler on the Roof there. And uh, and that was that was fun. Now the only problem that th th they are, Rainbow Stage is protected from the rain, but the only problem is that if, if it rain, ha rains hard, you're drowned out. You really have to project. Was, there a, was that a rainy season, do you remember? Or was it? No, it wasn't, but I do remember one night it, it, it poured and it was uh, quite noisy. Uh, while you were there, did you have any uh, encounters with Tom Hendry? He was, or was that no, no. Was he still part of that at the time? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, because he was the artistic director, I think, for a while. Um, do you remember what what years that was, or what year that was that you went there? Hmm. In the 60s. Or? Yes, I think it might have been it might have been the early 70s, actually. That's not still going on, I don't think, is it? The oh yes, I, th I think so. Yeah. Um. Jack Shapiro, I think, was the name of the, the artistic director who was there when I went. Um, you also uh, had the opportunity to work uh, while Joy Coghill was uh, 
at the Playhouse later on. Mm -hmm. Walking Happy. Walking Happy, yeah. which was directed by Malcolm. So you've had several plays with him. Yes, mm -hmm. at least at least three, four maybe. Did you find when you kept coming back to the Playhouse under different artistic directors that there was a different feeling? Like when Joy was there, was it a different atmosphere than it was when uh, Michael Johnson was there? Was, you know, did you feel the company had a different philosophy? No, I th I think you would have to 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 speak to somebody who was maybe in all the plays and 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 got the feeling of a place. Um, but when you when you go in and 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 do one play, you don't get as much of the of that. The the problem is that um, uh, when the playhouse changes artistic directors, is that quite often if you haven't worked with that person ever before, you've got to somehow break in and introduce yourself and try to get an audition and have that person get to know you. So that's, that's the difficulty of, of having, that for, for the actor, for having new artistic directors all the time. Right. You, uh, in 1967, um, one of the things that is a common thread I find is that the, the challenges of touring um, have always been, you know, there and they always lead to um, usually quite interesting circumstances uh, based on my conversations to date. And you toured in 1967 with 100 Years of Musical Comedy. Um, did you tour right across Canada or was it Western Canada that you, you went right across Canada with that? Yes, we didn't, um, we didn't um, play in every province because some provinces had set up their own uh, touring companies for the centennial year. But we started out in uh, Labrador City, and and that was was interesting. Um, it's a, a a gold mining town, and uh, I can rem I think we took off with our equipment on Little Wabash Lake, and I can remember the paint plane going across the lake and just sort of we were so heavy just sort of taking off before we got to the other end of, of the lake but it was quite thrilling um, flying over the Bering Straits and seeing icebergs down below and we flew, flew over Churchill Falls and um, and that was that was quite an experience it, it um, that that trip was quite an adventure because we had to um, we very seldom had two nights in one place, so we were traveling in the daytime, uh, most of the time by car, and setting up in the late afternoon in the place where we were going to do the show that night, and, uh, and doing the show, and then getting up the next morning and going on again. So it was, um, it was very tiring. And we had to be able to adapt to different stages and different circumstances every night, practically. Do any of those stages stand out in your mind as being really unbelievable? Or? Yes. One town on the prairies, I can remember, uh, all we had to change in was a trailer, which didn't have any sanitary facilities at all. And we were on a, a wooden stage outdoors, and uh, there was um, a cattle auction going on at the same time, so that was our competition. And I remember we just said to ourselves, you know, this is unbelievable. <laughs> But that was that was the worst we ever had. It was really difficult performing on a hot afternoon with the sun beating down on us, and as I say, all this competition in the background. On the flip side, was there one 
performance in one place that just was a wonderful experience, either with the audience or just everything just went. Well, we I remember we played in St. St. John, Newfoundland, and in a, a center, an arts center that had had just opened. Apparently, it was one of Joey Smallwood's um, presents to the city, and um, they had wonderful facilities there, and. Um, I happened to have had the experience of being in a folk song program in television for some some years, and um, I had sung a lot of Newfoundland folk songs. And so when we had done the program, uh, when we finished our program, 100 Years of Musical Comedy, um, for an encore, I led our cast in, in uh, Eyes the By That Builds the Boat. And uh, they were a tremendously receptive audience. They just, they just loved that. Very, very warm audiences in, in Newfoundland. Mm. That makes a great difference. It must have been, it's always interesting when you go to smaller communities, obviously, because they don't have any opportunities to see live theater, so your audiences maybe receive you in a different way. I mean, well, I remember a place in the Yukon. I think it was Haynes Junction where we played in the basement of a school and the stage was very, very small and one of the numbers <clears throat> that we did in the show was Shall We Dance from the King and I and I had taken the costume that I'd worn in Theatre on the Stars production of The King and I and there wasn't much room to spare when I was standing on the stage and piano was on the stage too. So you can imagine how difficult it was to to do the dance from the King and I in, in that space. But we encountered places like that too. But we just had to try somehow to adapt. And there I think the audiences didn't have very many traveling shows. And I remember some of the Aboriginal children sitting in the in the front row. And when I came in with that costume on, you know, just ooh, bug-eyed. <laughs> it must have been fun. It must have been just great to be able to know that you know this might be the yes. first experience. With That's you right. And yes. And we're doing it. Want to take a break and have a break? Well, All right. Can, how are we doing for tape, Jim? Oh, we're near the end of the second one. Okay. I guess what would uh, I'd like to go on now would be Charlottetown and um, your time there. I don't have a lot, so I'm hoping that, you know I have a little bit from Maver Moore and I have a little bit from Don here, and I think mm -hmm. that, uh, you know just the stories um, of your memories of that would be wonderful to have uh, from that time. You were there for two seasons. Two seasons. Mm -hmm. Did you want to change state first, Jim? Okay. 